Hello and welcome to Ways to Change the World. I'm Krishnan Giri Murthy and this is the podcast in which we talk to extraordinary people about the big ideas in their lives and the events that have helped shape them. This is unusual this week because we are on location near the top of the Arslaw Middle Orbit Tower in the Olympic Park, which I haven't been to for over 10 years. And we've got an amazing view across London. And our guest today is one of the founders of the UK grime uh, and rap scene, Lethal Bizzle. He's had different incarnations as Lethal B. His real name, of course, is Maxwell Owusu Ansa. Um, and, um, and just over there, we can look out to Stratford. And so what does this area mean to you? This area was like my musical school. This actual building we're actually sitting in used to be the pirate radio station where basically I started my career. And there was also a nightclub underneath it. And that was where we used to do our under 18 raves. So this is basically the development of me becoming the musician um, I am today. So that's why I picked it because I actually haven't been here since then. And it was like, when you said you wanted to interview me, I've got a location. I was like, yeah, let's go back home. And I don't live too far from me. I'm from Wolfenstein originally. So that's like five, 10 minutes from here. But yeah, this, this, this area is very important. It's very important to my generation as well. Other artists like Dizzy Rascal, Kano, the Wileys, the Skeptors, the Jamie. This, is, this was basically our Brit school. This is where we learned our skills. And we didn't realize at the time, we were just having fun, you know, coming radio every day and doing events underground, under 18 parties. But then little did we know that it was actually training for the bigger picture. What, why was there so much talent here? Good question. Um, one thing I would say is I was lucky to live in East London because all the gatekeepers, like you said, a lot of talent was, was all around, surrounded with each other. And I got a stroke of luck with that because the owner of the radio station we used to go on, I went to school with and he was from my area. And it was literally that connection that I had with him that got me the opportunity. And I feel maybe the, the inspiration of just seeing people from around the way doing this thing on the radio inspired other MCs to say, yo, let me see if I can have a go at that. And then it just kept spiraling. And then East London was like the hub of grand music for a few years. So when you talk about the gatekeepers, mm -hmm. in the old days, that they would be the record companies. Yeah. For you, you're talking about radio stations. Yes, yeah, radio stations, radio stations, um, promoters. They were the gatekeepers because major labels wasn't really focused on us. Like it was street music. I don't think they understood it. But we had our own industry, so we wasn't really looking for major labels. So we had our radio station. That was basically our equivalent of having a Radio 1. We had our under 18 raves. There was a venue called Stratford Rex, which is like a stone throw from here. That was like our Glastonbury. You know, we had all different promoters, different venues that kind of emulated what's going on now. Not as big as scale, but that was enough for us, you know, and it taught me a lot and made me ready for what was about to come, which I wasn't aware of, but self-consciously I was, I was training. What did you think you were doing? What were, you know, did you have a sense that this was something new that was going to grow or was it, was it your world that you thought would just be that world? You hit the nail in the head. I just thought it was going to be that world. I didn't think it was going to, you know, take over the world as it, as it did or not even the world, just the country. I just thought I can go on radio, say my lyrics. When I go back to my state, I'm the cool guy. Like people playing my music in their cars, just local. But you it know. was small. It was very small, you know, and um, it wasn't until it wasn't until I say when I was in More Fire Crew, and then we made a song called Oi, and that started causing so much noise on the streets, and it started travelling organically into other parts and different demographics, and that's when it got the major labels' attention. And that's when I started to believe a bit more like, oh, maybe this is actually bigger than making just songs for the locals or just the boys and the man them that's in the area. And then that was a song that basically changed my life and, you know, my whole perspective changed from that. When you think about Oi, mm -hmm. I mean, why that song? Why do you think that took off? I've got to give credit to Soul Solid Crew because I feel like we made a similar type of music. And just like anything, especially with the music industry, when something's hot, they're always looking for the next one. And we had this song, Oi, on the underground, causing mayhem, getting played in underground parties, 
there's not even a music video for it yet and everybody loves the song. So half of the work was already done. So they label saw this and they were like, well, if we added our infrastructure and added our machine behind this, we could probably push this to a part of the world that maybe us ourselves couldn't. And they did that. And we went from being in a council estate to being on top of the pops, doing Pepsi Max, all these other TV shows that don't exist no more, CD UK, so many shows, meeting like superstars. And then I was still living in Walthamstow. So I'll be on TV coming home and still kind of facing reality and not trying to let it go to my head. Cause I'm like, listen, like, you've got a big song, but you're still living at your mum's. You still ain't made enough money yet to, you know, branch out and flee the nest yet. So that kind of kept me grounded, but it was not until that point is when I said, okay, well, this is it now. I really want to pursue this music career. Cause up until then, it was just more of a hobby. How old were you? I think I was like six, 17, cause I was in college. So, so mum and dad? Yeah. Probably not very happy. At all. I was in college at the time and I was doing a A-level course in electronic engineering, which I didn't want to do. My dad kind of forced me to do it, education. I was like, cool, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have a go at it. Then when I got to the second year, that's when more fire crew started happening. But again, it was just a hobby. So I didn't think, you know, it was going to go crazy, but it did. And it got so mad that I kept missing college classes because I had shows to do or I had interviews to do. So I spoke to my lecturer and I said, like, I'm doing music at the moment and it's taking a lot of my time up and I'm kind of falling behind. And he just said, listen, you can come back, complete, you know, just basically carry on what you're doing. If you want to come back next year and complete the year again. When you failed, in other words, is yeah, what yeah. you thought. Basically, probably, yeah. yeah. Basically come back and, you know, we'll accept you to, you know, reapply, re-enroll. So I was like, okay, perfect. So I thought it was a perfect plan. So I told my dad, I said, dad, so, um, the more fire crew thing is kicking off now. I think we're gonna get a deal. We're gonna, we're gonna go on tour. So I spoke to the college and they said that they're gonna give me time off and then I can go back like next year. And he was just looking at me like, have you lost your mind? And he was like, so you're dropping out of college? I was like, no, I'm not dropping out. I'm gonna go back. Like, I was adamant that I was gonna go back. I said, no, I'm gonna go back and finish. But because of the music, and my dad was just like, all right. We didn't speak for maybe 10 months. Months. Yeah, he, we didn't speak for each other. Like he just literally was living in the same house. He'll be upstairs, I'll be downstairs, or vice versa. He was just disgusted that I'm stopping education to do music. He didn't understand it. He kept saying to me, this music game is so fickle. People come, people go, people don't last. So good luck to you, basically. Like, oh, okay, we'll see how, see how you get on. And then I think when he saw more Fire Crew was doing well, he started to slowly warm towards the idea, but then he was like, all right, you see like, you know what you're doing. I'm going back to Ghana now. You're on your own. And I'm like 18 now. I'm like, oh, what? <laughs> what do you mean you're going back to Ghana? He's like, yeah, my job's done now. He said, you're not going to college, you're doing music. The rest is up to you. Do you think he was still basically yeah, really yeah. disgusted? Yeah, yeah he, was, he, he didn't, he didn't, he wasn't for it, and especially we're talking like 2001, 2002. There wasn't any examples of UK artists that was doing similar music that had a longevity career. It was more just looking at the Americans and even artists in general back then, it was very hard to sustain a career more than five years, you know? So he was looking at those examples and thought, listen, it's not, it's not possible. Like you might have a good time for a couple of years, but then you're gonna have to go get a job or you're gonna have to go get re-educated. So he was just like, I'm done. Well, that must have hurt. Hundred percent. It was scary. It was. Um, you know, because we all want our dads to be proud of us. Hundred percent. And my most scary part was when he said he's going back to Ghana. And then, so I was thinking, hold on a minute. If you're going back to Ghana, then my mum was like, "Yeah, well, I'm going with him." So I was like, "Hold on a minute." Then I had a little brother. Unfortunately, he had to go with them because he was still young. So they're like, "Yeah, the house is yours." Just, just so you just lost your whole family? Literally, they just went back. Literally, like that. And then I had to basically become the man of this two-bedroom house in Walthamstow, pay the bills, and make sure everything was taken care of. How did that feel? In hindsight, looking back, it probably made me stronger than I actually realised because I was in a position where I couldn't depend on anyone anymore. I had to basically go out and do it now because it's all or nothing. So. There was a lot of pressure, but 
I remember just saying, Biz, literally, you have to just go for it because there's no mum and dad to ask for. Mum, can I borrow 10 pound? Or dad, can you give me a 10 hour? There was none of that. It's like, it's, you have to be independent. So I had to grow up a lot faster than the average 18 year old would. So they had come from Ghana? Yeah. What, what did they do? Um, so when my mum was here, she was actually a chef. She was a chef in um, central London and my dad was a mechanic. Right. So I think that's with the electronic, I used to fix my dad's cars with him and do stuff with him. So he was like, you're good with your hands and you like electrical. So he was like, electronic engineering, that's the one for you. So they had ambitions for you? Yeah, 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 they, yeah, they did. They, yeah. they, wanted, they wanted the best for me. And you know, I don't dispute that. And I understand their reasons and I forgive them for why they did what they did. But I feel like them going back to Ghana was a bit of a blessing in disguise because I don't think I could have created that drive that, I, that it gave me knowing that I had to be independent and I had to make this work. I could probably would have been a bit more laid back knowing uh, I've still got a house a roof over my head. Mum's going to cook for me if I come home. Like, so that was like a real kick up the backside. So that culture you were part of, age 16, mm -hmm. you talk about So Solid Crew. What was it? Was it, was it real or was it something that was kind of being made up? Was it, you know, um, was it borrowing from America? Was it, you know, what was going nah, on? No, it was, it was, I think why, if anyone was around back in 2001, 2002, what Soul Solid did, they managed to create the culture from the council estates in the UK and brought it to the TV. And I think that's why it was so impactful. Because when I saw them, I was like, who are these guys? We look similar, we dress similar, the areas you're in look very similar to mine because up until that, it was American rappers in New York or LA and I love those guys, mm. but it's not home. So when I saw that, I was like, this is cool. And then literally we'll go to like parties back then, there was loads of little underground parties. And even the way we dressed, like Soul Solid was emulating that. So it was almost like a cultural thing. Everybody could like relate because it was like they're actually from the streets or from the ends and they're bringing it to the TV. And the impact was just amazing. I remember those days, probably my most funniest times. I remember we'd go out and everyone's just having an amazing time, man. And everyone's dressed up and there's always an event on. And yeah, they, I feel like Soul Solid definitely painted a picture of what was actually going on in the council estates in London. And so, and so when did you discover hip hop? Eight, nine. Right. Eight or nine, but I didn't understand fully what it was. Yeah. And then when I used to go, funny enough, I used to go to my cousin's houses. They were older than me. And um, they used to all play all the real hip hop, all the swearing and stuff like that. And obviously I didn't have no money to buy songs. So whatever was being played, I would just listen to. And this is my dad's stuff. Um, and my cousin used to play these songs and I'd be like, no, who are these guys? Snoop Dogg. Like, I'd be like, no, this is cool. So I used to always look forward to going to his house. And I'd be like, who's next? And he'd play me another guy, Cypress Hill. And I was like, nah, this is cool, man. But my dad didn't go too deep into the like gangster rap. He was more kind of on the safer side. So when, when did you go from listening to doing it? It's actually funny because music wasn't my number one choice. I didn't want to be a musician. It happened, I say mistake, or shouldn't say an accident, but my first love was football. So I was heavily into football. I was actually doing all right. But again, my parents wasn't, supportive and I got injured one day and my dad was like you got injured and your manager hasn't come and seen how you are you see you need to stop this football thing and just concentrate on your education and I did listen this time or well, that time so I think with the music is when I thought to myself nah you know what I need to follow my gut instinct here because Jermaine Defoe was local I think he used to pay for Redbridge and I used to pay for Wolfham Forest and I saw he made it and I was just like, look at that. Like, the other day he was playing in the park with everyone. Now nah, he's bloody playing Premier League. So when the music thing started happening, it made me go, no, Biz, let's give this a go. But to answer your question, I wouldn't say until more fire crews when I took it seriously, because prior to that, it was just a hobby. But do you remember picking up a mic? Yeah. that's quite a big step, isn't it? Just picking up but a again, mic. But again, it was just fun. It was like just going to have a kickabout with the boys. Like we'll go to our friend's house, he's got turntables and we're just freestyling. Like we're just literally just rapping. We'll be in the playground. I went to school with Ozzy B, who was another member in Morphi crew. And we used to just freestyle in the playground. Like we didn't ever think we was going to have a career or anything like that. It was literally just having fun. Sometimes we might go play five a side with the boys. Sometimes we'll go to my boy's house and we'll do like a little mixtape, just freestyling. 
And literally, that was it. There was no real ambitions for me to say, yeah, one day I'm going to be a rapper, I'm going to be a huge star. Because I just didn't think it was possible because I just thought that was for the American. That's the American dream and we're in London and there was no one I could look to to say, oh, well, he's done it. So let's try it until Soul Solid did it. Where did your name come from? Oh, mate. <laughs> this, uh, uh, this, uh, you know, what? it's so funny. Like when you're young, you just say weird things. But obviously it stuck with me. But um, I was in school and then we used to all just freestyle. And then... I remember someone was like, but what's your, what's your rap name? What's your MC name? And I was just like, I don't know, actually. What is my MC name? I don't know. Like, so everyone was just calling me Max. And then my guy, one guy called his name Sniper. And I was like, oh, I should have called myself Sniper. So he's like, no, nah, I'm MC Sniper. So I was like, oh, all right. So I just thought, what can I think of? That's a cool name. That's kind of dangerous. And then I was in my front room one day and I saw the Lethal Weapon um, VHS tape. And I was like, Lethal. I was like, nah, Lethal, cause it's got to have something else. And I just thought, B. And I just went to school next and I said, yeah, I'm Lethal B. <laughs> and then literally it was just like that. That's how basically I, I came out with it. And then I changed it to Bizzle a little later on. What well, is there a difference between Lethal B and Lethal Bizzle? Yeah, there is. Um, so it's like I've created two alter, like an alter ego where Lethal B was that young, reckless, naive, energetic child, kid that was just, didn't really have much knowledge. This was just, you know, having fun, you know, talking about things about my environment. And then the transition came after More Fire Crew. We went through a bit of a weird spell where the, the music, well, the street music industry, if you want to call it that, got a lot of backlash from the police. So Solid felt a lot of that um, tension, but that reflected on Morphi crew as well. So it was like, we kind of got blackballed or shut down basically. And I remember just thinking, okay, um, well, I need to learn from this because if we have to do this again, we need to learn from my mistakes. So I was like, I need to rebrand myself. And I started thinking of plans. I was like, I need to start my own record label and not rely on a record label because they've just basically thrown us back to the streets and said, you know, go back to where you lot came from. We don't need your services no more. So I just said, all right, cool. It's Lethal Bizzle now. Literally just like that. Because to be fair, the Izzle thing was like a trending thing on the street at the time. So everything, everybody was adding Izzle to everything. Oh, you got a phone Izzle? Or it was just like a cool thing. I was like, yeah, let me put the Izzle after the B, so it's Bizzle. And then I said, I'm going to start my own record label, Leafwood Buzzy Records. And then the first release was Pow. And it was like, yes, rebrand, I'm back. Let's go again. The thing is, I mean, you know, you, you talk about how you were frozen out mm -hmm. uh, when you were part of Morphire Crew. Uh, Pow arrives mm. and you kind of walk into the same thing, don't you? Yeah, so... We got frozen out with Morphi crew, the police, you know, um, the tabloids, like they were just like, they just basically threw everybody into the same pot that was making similar music to what Soul Soda was making. And they were just like, yeah, all of that stuff is dead. We don't want nothing to do with it. Which made us have to go back to the underground, come back to this exact area where basically we had to go. But what were they saying to you and what were you saying in return? You know, because you were just making music. They were yeah. branding it as violence and gangster yeah. and all that kind of nonsense. Yeah. I and mean, were you arguing back and saying, you know? No, 100%. We was obviously upset, but um, we didn't have much resources then to really voice our opinion unless it was through the music. You know, social media wasn't as influential then. I don't even know if it even existed. I don't, this is 2003 when it happened, so I don't think hardly, I think MySpace might have been the biggest social media platform at the time. So you were essentially powerless at that stage? Basically, like we had to basically go back to the streets and go back to square one again. And basically came back to this area and went back to our radio station sets, went back to doing underground raids again and started building up more momentum on the street. Because when you're from a scene like grime or hip hop, when you cross over, Sometimes the core fans are like, ah, oh, you left us and oh, you, you thought you was too big for us. And that happened to Morphire Crew. We went from being on the streets and then the music took us 
outside of our natural environment. So we're touring around Europe, we're touring around UK. So the pirate radio sets and the underground raves, we didn't have time for that anymore. But they looked at that as maybe neglect, but it was purely because we didn't have time. And also maybe a bit of ego where it was a bit like, ah, look, we kind of made it now, like we're young and we're like, yeah, we're on TV. But when we had to go, well, when I had to go back to that, it was, I wouldn't say, it was, it, was, it, was a, it was a weird feeling because people were looking like, ah, you thought you was a superstar, but now you're back with us now. But I expected it. And then I just said, listen, Biz, right now it's all or nothing. Your parents are going back to Ghana. You need to get your shit together. So I literally had to just go tunnel vision and basically do everything I did before the Morphi Crew Oil song come. I started the process. The PAL songs come around now. And I think Pow Happening was a big part of me doing those things, going back on the underground, building up my buzz again, making my fellow MCs think, no, he's actually good. Like, I actually want to work with him. And I knew that was the process I had to build up because at that time, they probably thought, ah, your, your career's over now. Like, after Morphi Crew, like, you're done. So I said, cool, I can't use the Morphi leverage because it's not leverage anymore. I have to start again. So Pow's happened. And it felt even bigger than Morphire because I did it on my own label now and everyone's saying Lethal Bizzle and the impact it's having. I don't think I've seen, to this day, I've seen how people get touched by that song, seeing it perform in the club, hearing it in cars, just reaction from people on the street. The street music and the kids, whatever they're into, is what's normally is going to be the next wave that's going to happen and Power was one of those one of those moments. When you look back at the way uh, your, you know, grime and the people were, were being viewed and portrayed in the media by politicians and all of that, um, how much, um, you know, discrimination, racism do you think there um, was in that? And there how was, much of it was justified? I think a lot of racism and a lot of discrimination was involved. Um, the way they were just, you know, laboured in us and not really taking time out to actually understand like where we're coming from but then on the other side I have to see I have to see from their point of view as well that you're actually not in these environments that we're actually in so from the onlooker you might just hear something and see something and think oh these guys are just crazy oh listen to what they're saying but it's like we this is actually what we see in where we live you know in in inner London so it's kind of like two sides to the argument I do feel that it was a bit of a slap in the face, especially after when they tried to freeze us with the, after more fire. Then we proved ourselves again. And they're like, no, see, these guys, look, they're bad. Look at the music. But then the power of the people overpowered all the noise. And they tried to ban Pal. And then even David Cameron came out for me when he was the prime minister and tried to say, ah, oh, this music you're making is bad and it's... Lethal Bizzle is wrong. Yeah, yes. I'm wrong. And <laughs> this, is like, this, is, this is bad on the community. And I was like, well, you're the bloody prime minister, like, help us, like, help these bloody communities. Do you know what I mean? And then we won't have to talk about these things that we see. So if, if you met Cameron now, what would you say? I would, I would actually laugh. I would actually laugh because all of that, for me, I saw that was someone trying to stop me moving forward and trying to, you know, obviously you're the prime minister, you're the most powerful person in the country. And it was quite flattering that I got your attention, you know, like, Little old me from Walthamstow, you actually had to take time out of your day to go to a newspaper and felt that you had to reply to me. So that kind of showed how um, impactful my movement was and how impactful the song was. And I think that's more powerful than anything. The people stood up and said, no, we understand what he's saying. We're not going to go out and basically do what he's talking about, but he's talking about his reality. And I'll probably just laugh at him, to be fair. Um, and I asked him, why did he do Brexit as well? Why, what's your view of Brexit? I just think it was a stupid thing to do. I just think it's alienated the country. But you know what? One thing about being in London, we're actually spoilt. Because London's a beautiful city. You know, probably one of the best cities in the world. But there are some parts in this country that are very neglected. And I feel like a lot of those parts is the ones that voted for it because they don't get to enjoy a lot of the things that we take for granted. 
you know, the best, most entertainment they may have is maybe a football club that's doing well, whether it's Premier League or whether it's a lower division. But in terms of that entertainment or just their city being celebrated or, you know, being a notorious attraction, you know, it's almost been just left to the wayside. It doesn't get spoke about. You, you, you tweet about cryptocurrency from time to time. Yeah, I got into crypto. I listened to, what's his name, Rishi. Yeah, he said to find a new skill, in it. So I said, all right, mate, cool. Let me see what I can do. So, um, so I started looking into stocks, started looking into crypto, and then started doing my research, came across Bitcoin. And I've been on the fence with Bitcoin for some time. Like, a lot of my friends got in early, around 2017, and they were like, Biz, you need to come and sit down with me. Let me explain how this thing works. And I was just like, nah, I wasn't interested. Plus, I was too busy with doing my own career. So where everybody's in lockdown, I had time now. So I was like, okay, let me start investigating and do some research. And then after a few, a few weeks, I was like, you know what, I'm confident, I'm gonna, I'm gonna invest. And I think I invested probably at the right time because it was just before the, the spike was about to happen. So it was like late 2020, early 2021. And then Bitcoin just started rising. I was just like, oh my God, this is great. Like I started telling all my friends, no, listen, bro, you need to buy Bitcoin. Then I'm seeing Ethereum's another one. Oh, we need to get some more Ethereum. That's another crypto coin. And it's like a rabbit hole. You just start digging deeper and deeper and deeper. But then the harsh reality is what goes up must come down. And, um, and it's come down. It's come down. So have you, have, you, have you overall made a lot of money out of crypto or are you now down? I'm down. I'm down. That's a, that's a lesson. I'm, no, it is a lesson. And, and you know what? I'm glad I'm learning it because they, they always say the hodl word is the most common word. And... Looking at the history, there's a lot of data you can actually see now where Bitcoin was five, ten years ago, and it's just kept, kept rising. And if you've got the willpower to like hold and not pull out, are the ones that really, you know, are rewarded. So I'm in that, you know, just put it to one side mode. But it's also a risk as well, you know, like everything in cryptocurrency. I wouldn't go and say put, you know, what you can afford to lose if you're going to invest in it because. I think KSI, I don't know if he's lying, but he said he put like seven figures into a coin a few days ago and now it's worth like, I think like three figures. And I'm just like, mate, like that is, that is brutal. So he can afford to lose that at the moment. He's doing well. Yeah, yeah. but I mean, it's not advisable. You know, <laughs> losing money is not, is, not, is not the one to do. But yeah, I would just say, if you do want to get involved in that, I would say invest what you're willing to lose. You know, the, the culture of music, rap music, whether it's here or in America, mm is bound up with, with money and consumerism and objects mm. and cars and watches and uh, yeah. all, all those sorts of things. Um, how do you feel about all of that? I mean, is it, are you comfortable with it? As you get older, do you think this is all, you know, this is, this is bad values or? I think when I first started, a lot of those things were important to me. Cars, jewelry, clothes, you know, because it was like a symbol and it, it kind of, it, it represented something and there is a perception of you wearing certain things, driving a certain car, there's a feeling that you get, there's a respect you get. So I think just as humans, we always strive to get that respect and get that notoriety to some degree, you know, not as flamboyant to maybe some rappers. But as I've got older, Maybe I can say this because I've done a lot of the things I wanted to do in terms of getting the cars I wanted and the jewelry I wanted. But as I've got older, I've definitely, I definitely do think about the money I've wasted <laughs> on some of these things and just think like, but then I say, you know what? But I enjoyed it. I had a good time. And Ghana as well has, has become, you know, you've kind of gone full circle, haven't you? Yeah. You're investing in Ghana and yeah. part of a really interesting scene there. Yeah, Ghana is, um, well, that's where my parents are from. And funny, I went to Ghana in the late 80s. I was like a little kipper. I remember it like yesterday and I hated it. I was like, what is this place? Like, my mum was like, yeah, this is where I was born. And I was just like, no, mum, I want to go home. Like, and I remember going home. I actually got ill as well. I remember, I think I caught malaria and then I was just like, nah, mum, I never want to go back here. Like, it was just too different to London. Like, I didn't understand it. I'm like five years old. I was like, nah, mum, this is crazy. It wasn't as developed as it is now. And then I went back in 2003. So my, that's the year my parents left. So I went back to see them for Christmas. 
and I just saw how much developed it was. I was just like, like we'll take things for granted, like just the roads were done, you know, um, there was a lot more shops and stuff. And I was just like, all oh, right, actually this place is, it's, it's a lot better than what I thought it was. And then I just kept going back more regular. And then all my cousins are older now with similar ages. So when I go back there, they're taking me to local spots. And then every Christmas, that's a tradition with African, with Ghanaians, we go back to home to see the family and spend Christmas there. The younger generation started doing their own events so we can go out. Because before it was just the older lot, it was your mum, your dad, they'll go to like dinner and dances and you just be in the house. But then my generation started doing parties and then there was just these cool parties happening all the time. So I just kept going, kept going. And then I'll be showing it on my social media and then people will be like, where are you? I'll be like, I'm in Ghana. They'll be like, no way, no, I look sick out there. I was like, yeah, bro, like you need to come and see what's going on. And then one day I just said, you know what? I'm gonna make it my duty to almost be like the unofficial tourism ambassador of Ghana and just showcase everything. Anytime I go there, I just wanna let people know like you need to actually come here and experience it. So I kept doing that. And then opportunities just started coming my way and I'm, I've been invested in a development apartment block there right now in the heart of Accra, which is, it's looking like it's gonna be maybe one of those like the Shard or the Burj Khalifa of Ghana, the way the building is, is looking right now. And my biggest, proudest moment is seeing people that are not Ghanaian go there, because that's one of the things I've always wanted to do. I just felt at one point, it was only Ghanaians going back home, where now people are actually seeing it as a holiday destination from different cultures. And that's what I wanted to try and do. And it seems like we're getting there now. But do, you, do you think you sort of have to want examine the sort of the, the attitude as well a bit you know there's like there's yeah. a bit of a inferiority complex isn't yeah there? yeah yeah for people who come from who have origins abroad mm -hmm. whose parents came here you are you you grow up to think well they came here because it's rubbish over there and it's mm. better over here yeah suddenly you're going back there and it's good yeah that's quite a yeah no that's true and i feel like maybe when my parents did come here they didn't there wasn't maybe opportunities for them than maybe there is now you know i think um opportunities and infrastructure, the economy definitely needs to keep growing. And I feel like, especially with this president right now, he's, I think he was actually educated here and he understands why people left because they felt abroad was the land of opportunity. But now it's about building up our own home. So these kids feel like they don't have to leave now because there is opportunities where I am already. But do you think it also changes the identity of British Ghanaians? You know, in, in that you can, be, you can be more proud of where you Oh, 100%. Came from oh, no, 100%. And not, you know, and, and not take the sort of oh, yeah, yeah, you yeah. come from the jungle. Oh, no, 100%. Thing, you know. I mean, mate, I'm from the area where being African was butt of all jokes. Like, I mean, I remember when I went to school and then people asked me where I'm from, I'd be like, oh, that like Ghana. And they didn't know where it was but they knew of Guyana. And being a Caribbean those days was the coolest thing ever. If you was Jamaican in my school, you're getting all the girls. Like you was the coolest guy, like. Um, but again, there wasn't no representation of, of Ghanaians back then. Used to get all the silly jokes, African boo-boo or whatever. And I also feel like certain platforms and certain outlets has kind of shunned Africa to make it seem like it's just a place that always needs help. And it does need help. I'm not going to say it doesn't. But it was almost like that was the picture they wanted to consistently push. Like kids are just dying and flies are in their face and send money to help these people. So for someone who wants to go on holiday and they think of Africa, the first thing they will probably think of is, oh yeah, I saw it on this magazine and they were saying we need to help them. Like, why would you want to go there and for a relaxation? So that's another narrative I wanted to change, but that used to affect me because people used to associate me with what they see, what Africa was. So it was hard growing up in some, in some parts in school. I just think representation of me, even myself, being a Ghanaian, making songs in Morphi Ku Oi, whether you're white, black, Asian, African, Caribbean, like music is music. And I feel like that connection has definitely helped change people's identity or opinion on where someone's from because you like this song but he's african you know so you not like it no more that shouldn't be a question
And I think me doing that and making iconic songs like Pow, touching all types of cultures, again, shines a light that, rah, he's a London-born guy, but he's from Ghana. And I think the representation was lacking when I grew up. There wasn't anyone I could say, oh, he's from Ghana as well. So, so yeah, it's definitely proud to be African, to be fair, not just Ghanaian. Funny enough, I remember making me go deep. I used to see this Jamaican girl, like back in the day, I'm talking like 20 years ago. And she's from um, out of London. And I remember she was telling her friends like, oh yeah, I go like that boy from Morphi Crew. Like they're all excited. But when they found out I was African, they were like, uh huh? Like, why are you kind of an African for? And she was just like, what do you, what do you mean? She's like, like, he's African. Like, and I remember she told me, and I was just like, this is crazy. I used to go through this in school, and people are still feeling like that. And what, and what about you now? I mean, because, you know, you're, you're a, you're a grown-up. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. I mean, I so we're used to sort of ageing white rockers. We're used to hip-hop in America mm. now having Jay-Z and, you know, yeah, people yeah. who are almost middle-aged. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, can grime be grown up, or is it a young person's thing? I think it's definitely a bit of both. I think... Um, Obviously, I'm on the wrong side of 30 now, but I'm still hanging in there, no grades and stuff. Um, but yeah, I feel like, especially myself, I'm not living the same life I was living 20 years ago. And I'm imagining a lot of my fans are probably of similar age or maybe a bit younger, maybe some are a bit older. But the energy and the beats is very fresh. It's very always new, very raw. And I think that maybe attracts the younger generation. But I think the content in terms of what I'm talking about now is, it's a different perspective because I don't, I don't live here in Wolfenstow anymore. Um, I'm definitely living a different life I used to live. So there are elements where a lot of grown-ups can relate to because I'm actually talking about stuff they can actually, you know, vibe to and at the same time relate to what I'm saying because I'm a grown-up. But on the other hand, that energy, that rawness, you know, that street gritty sound is always, you know, gonna keep the youngers like interested to some degree. And, and do you, so do you still feel you're pulling in that young crowd? I feel like, I think I'm one of the lucky ones because right now the drill scene is what grime was 20 years ago in terms of the, the street kids, that's what they're into, they've got their fun like you know their MCs that they they like but I think the impact that my generation made always gives us another chance to make another impact because the songs are so iconic and the songs are still living today and the new generation have respect for us and we collab together and again that might even well, it will. If you're a young artist, you're not aware of me and I work with your favourite artist, that's a new guy, that's going to bring your attention. Or and that's what you're attention. doing now, isn't it? I mean, you're, yeah. you're doing sort of grime, drill and hip-hop all in one track. Yeah, no, definitely. I kind of I kind of embrace the new generation. You know, I'm not scared to evolve. And I just dropped a new song today, actually, with um, gigs and a drill artist called Debo from Ireland. And it's just embracing that new generation, man, because I remember when we was coming up, and we was coming like towards the tail end of the garage scene and the garage DJs and MCs were older than us and they didn't embrace us. And then that's how basically we broke off and it was just the grime scene and it was just me, Dizzy, Kano and we were just doing our own thing. But in, in hindsight, maybe they would have thought to have, you know, handled that a bit differently and embrace us and actually help us and give us the platform to showcase what we was doing. And I always remember, like, I used to always say to myself, like, when you're at a certain point is when you need to reach out to someone that needs help the most, like a new artist. And that's what I've always done. So a lot of these artists that are even hot right now, the Central Seas and, you know, there's a lot of guys that I've been supporting before anybody was actually going crazy because I just like their talent, you know, and I've got a platform and they, are probably fans of me and one day they might just wake up with notifications saying, rah, I saw you on Lethal Bizzle's Instagram or I saw him on Lethal Bizzle's Snapchat. You know, just give them a little shout out, give them a bit of a push and motivation as well, giving 
you know, new artists notoriety because that gives you that, that push to keep going because you're making noise, you're getting people's attention. So all these things I've always kept in my brain to always spread my platform where I can, man. Do you have remaining musical ambitions? Yeah, um, I don't want to say them yet, but I definitely do. I don't want to jinx them, but I definitely do. Um, right now, I just kind of feel like I'm in a different place mentally. My objective is different. And I almost want to be that example for the new generation to know that you can still be in the game for 20 years and still be cool and still be relevant and be smart and have that longevity. So that's the role I want to play right now. Is there any advice you would give to the younger generation? I interviewed Getz for this podcast a long time ago, mm. and he, he, he's obviously been on a real journey in terms of the way he, he portrays women, talks about women, mm -hmm. um, and he now talks about the need to respect women yeah. much more obviously. Yeah. In terms of values, um, you know, whether it's gender or homosexuality or drugs mm. or whatever it might be, those sorts of things, do you think there are, there are values that you would say to the, to the younger crowd now, mm -hmm. who are in, particularly in drill, yeah. Think about what you're doing, you know. No, a hundred percent, because I think for them, they've got a better blueprint for them to follow, for them to get their act together. We didn't. We was on the streets doing certain things we weren't supposed to be doing simultaneously, not knowing that there is an opportunity for us to change our life. A lot of these drillers can see that now. It's in front of their face. Get your head together. You can actually, you know, get out of the environment that you may be in at the moment, change your life forever. So I would say a lot of that, they need to just obviously it's plain blank in their face, but I can also understand at the same point, the environment they're in, and it's hard to get out of that environment. But the, f the irony of this thing is, the music I was making, whether it was deemed as violent, whether it was deemed as too aggressive, ultimately that's what got me out of the situation I was in. That's what helped me tour, earn money, start seeing different parts of the world, start meeting different people, changing my objective, changing the way I see things, changing my content because I'm growing now. So I just hope the drillers especially understand that I know everybody wants to be the top guy and wants to be the coolest, but do you want to be the coolest and the top guy for one year? Or do you want to do it for 10 years? Or do you want to do it for 20 like myself? So my advice would be there is enough blueprints for the young artists to start following. I'm not the only one who's been here for a while now. You've got other examples like Skepta, other examples like Kano. You can look at those careers and see how we did it and you know add your little sprinkle on top. And the goal is to try and make this thing last and not be a quick fix. And just think about the decisions you make because I know a lot of my friends can't travel around the world because of certain situations they did when they were younger. And when you're a musician, you want to have that free pass to travel, perform anywhere without any restrictions. So, so finally, I mean, look, we started off talking about actually how where we are today, you know, was quite yeah. a small world. Mm. Uh, and your world has got bigger through the course yeah. of your career. So, so you can define world in answer to this question however you like. If you could change the world in any way, mm -hmm. what would you do? If I could change the world, I would definitely stop racism. And everybody just saw people for who they were and not the colour or background or religion or beliefs. You just took someone for face value and judge them on that rather than colour. Bizzle, thank you very much indeed. Thanks for having me, man. I hope you enjoyed that. Thank you very much indeed for watching. You can catch all of these interviews on the Channel 4 News YouTube channel. Our producer is Freya Pickford. Until next time, bye-bye.